Hello, everybody, especially to my fellow New York Jets fans. Welcome to yet another New York Jets related video where I get to share with you guys some of my favorite, if not my favorite, New York Jets players growing up. Um, now, no, this is not who I think are the top 10 Jets players of all time. That, of course, may not be coming around for quite some time. But if you were to ask me who are some of my who are my favorite New York Jets players of all time that were a huge reason why I maintain my fandom of the Jets despite all the crap that this team has given me and to you guys over the years. But I felt, you know what, let me give you guys something else to talk about rather than just the awesome Jets win yesterday over the Houston Texans. Let me share with you guys my favorite, my all-time favorite New York Jets players of all time. Let's start off with the legendary fullback that spent most of his career with the Kansas City Chiefs. He did spend a couple years with the Vikings, and he spent the last three years of his career with our beloved New York Jets, and that is Tony Richardson. Tony Richardson is regarded by a lot of people as one of the all-time great blocking fullbacks. He blocked for multiple 1,000-yard rushers, including Priest Holmes, Larry Johnson, Chester Taylor, Adrian Peterson, and, of course, Thomas Jones. Uh, he had a tremendous football career. He, for the most part, stayed healthy, never really missed time due to injury. He was great in the he was great, great and productive football player. And he was also a leader in the clubhouse. You know, he set an example. He's a classy guy, he's very charitable, and he was a huge reason why the Jets from 2008 to 2010 had not only one of the better rushing attacks in the NFL, but one of the better offensive line units in the NFL. Next up is a, another player that spent most of his career with another team, but he's also a pro football Hall of Famer, and that is Alan Fanica. Now, why is Alan Fanica on this list even though he spent two years on the team? Well, it's simple. He was a beast, man. I mean, this is a guy that, despite being born and diagnosed with epilepsy, he kicked some serious ass on the football field. He was great in pass protection. He was great in the run game. He was a leader on and off the field. He was a huge reason why from 2008 to 2010, even though he should have had no business being cut heading into the 2010 season, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but he was a huge reason why the Jets' offensive line went from one of the league's worst to one of the league's best in the NFL during that time. Now, of course, for those of you who do not know, Alan Fanica was supposed to be on the roster in 2010, but that dipshit Mike Tannenbaum cut his ass to save like a few thousand dollars in the bank. And let me tell you, my dad, when he heard the news, he got pissed off. He was like, what the fuck are you guys doing? He was a great player. He was great. Why you got rid of him? Yes, Matt Slauson was good, but he wasn't Alan Fanica. Al Fanica is an all-time great offensive lineman, and my dad felt he still had something left in the tank, and the Jets decided to part ways with him, which I thought was doing him dirty. But yeah, Alan Fanica was great. Next up on the list is Damian Woody. Now, Damian Woody spent most of his career winning two Super Bowls with the New England Patriots. He also spent a few years with the Detroit Lions. But man, when he came over to the Jets, he was also a huge contributor to the Jets' offensive line unit from 2008 to 2010. He was a huge reason why the Jets' offensive line was one of the league's best, along with Alan Fanica and Tony Richardson. These guys were tremendous together. In my opinion, I think Damian Woody should deserve consideration for the Pro Football Hall of Fame because he was that damn good. He was that guy. He was a leader. He was very vocal inside and outside the clubhouse. And for a wide variety of good reasons, this guy didn't tolerate bullshit. This guy grew up with a... Developed the winning mentality, and that's a lot of to do with his years with the Patriots. Uh, but yeah, man, this was fantastic. I, I really freaking loved it. I love Damian Woody. Next up is David Harris, a.k.a. the Hitman. Uh, David Harris, to me, should go down in history as one of the all-time great uh, Jets defenders and linebackers. In the history of the franchise, the guy is one of the all-time leading tacklers in the history of the franchise. The guy was a massive fan favorite by many, if not all, Jets fans for his 10-plus year tenure with the team. He never really missed time due to injury. He was a very good player in the clubhouse. He was a very productive player on the field. 
Granted, I wouldn't put him in the same class as Ray Lewis, Patrick Willis, or Brian Urlacher, which were the other premier middle linebackers of his generation, but damn it, David Harris was no scrub. He was easily one of the best middle linebackers of his generation. He was solid in pass coverage, but man, he was a beast of a tackler. He could hit. He could hit him. He could hit, man. He could pop somebody if he needed to. He was great blitzer. I mean, this guy was one of the best players on the New York Jets defense for many, many years. Even during the Rex Ryan days, he was pretty damn good. I mean, he was very good at pressuring the quarterback when he needed to. He was an excellent tackler. He didn't really miss a lot of tackles, David Harris. He was a phenomenal football player. And from what I heard, he was an absolute gentleman off the field. And that, to me, matters because people judge you not just by your production, but by your character. And David Harris was just a simple, absolute beast. Even though he ended his career with the Patriots, I felt the Patriots did him dirty by not utilizing him enough. But that's a different story for another time. Next up on this list is the Brickishaw Ferguson. Now, this was when McCann Backton was drafted in 2020, he was pretty much brought in to be the true successor of the Brickishaw Ferguson. While McCann Backton hasn't exactly lived up to that expect to that hype yet, the Brickishaw Ferguson, you know, you could say he wasn't as talented as McCann Backton. He was a damn good offense. You can argue that he's a borderline Hall of Fame offensive lineman. This guy played all 10 years with the New York Jets. He never missed a game. He did miss one snap, and damn it, he was as solid as a rock. He wanted to get some premier defensive linemen, outside linebackers slash pass rushes of his generation, and for the most part, he held down the fort extremely well. I mean, he, yeah, he gave up sacks here and there, but he didn't give up a whole lot of sacks. He was consistently, year in and year out, even during the down years, one of the best players on the Jets, one of the best offensive linemen in the NFL. And for a good reason, the guy was a stud. The guy was a rock, man. He was stellar. He was a great guy in the clubhouse. He was a leader in the clubhouse. He was one of the best players on the Jets' offensive line. Even when the Jets' offensive line sucked, he was consistently year in year one of the best players on the New York Jets. Next up on the list is his teammate that was also drafted in 2006, Nick Mangot. Now, this guy, to me, smells and looks like a Hall of Famer. What I mean by that is this guy played... 10 to 11 years with the New York Jets, and throughout the majority of his career, he was one of the most dominant centers in the NFL. He rarely missed time due to injury. I'll never forget watching a Jets game, whether it was a preseason game or a regular season game, where he played with a bloody finger. I mean, a lot of these players today are a bunch of bitches. They refuse to play through injury a lot of the time. Nate Mango didn't give a fuck if he was... If his dick was hurting, if, his, if he lost a fucking pinky, he still snapped that fucking ball. That's how Nick Mango was. Nick Mango was a beast. He was one of the best players in the NFL. He was one of the best centers in the NFL for a wide variety of reasons. He was a stud. An absolute bona fide stud on the New York Jets throughout his entire career. And I'll never forget that he said, I wanted to retire a Jet. He could have gone somewhere else, but no, he chose to retire a fucking jet. And that's saying something. Next up is Jericho Cotri. Now, I know Jericho Cotri spent a lot of years with the Steelers and the Panthers, but he started off as a New York Jet, and damn it, in my opinion, he was one of the better wide receivers that we had. He was a very good route runner. He had very good hands. He was extremely charitable. He was a leader in the clubhouse. And he was clutch. I'll never forget in the playoff game, in Mark Sanchez's first playoff game against the Bengals, he made some great catches in that game. Hell, I'll never forget in the Cleveland Browns game where, despite hurting his groin, he ran his route, dove, and caught the pass for Mark Sanchez. I mean, that goes to just how good of a player Jericho Cotchby was. Yeah, it sucked he lost the seed, even though he played in the Super Bowl with the Panthers, and unfortunately he lost because of how good the Broncos defense was that year. Excuse me, but damn it, he was a damn good football player. I mean, he was a solid wide receiver, did what he had to do, was a competitor, had some, some of his best games against the Patriots. He was a solid football player. He really, really was. Next up on the list is the original OG Big Cat himself, Sean Ellis. Now, this guy was drafted the same year that 
John Abraham was drafted. He's, uh, I think, one of two first-round draft picks by Bill Parcell. And Sean Ellis was a very good football player. He was a solid defensive lineman. Granted, I will accept, I will admit that, in my opinion, I thought he was better against the running as a pass rusher. But darn it, he was a solid pass rusher. But obviously, I thought he was better against the run than he was as a pass rusher. But he was still a very good player. I'll never forget the game he had against the Patriots where he just almost single-handedly tore up that Patriot offensive line. Like, he was playing like he was a man for this, and he was a huge reason why we won that game. He was a humongous reason uh, why we won that game. Not the reason, but a huge reason. And um, he was that guy. He was that dude. He was that dude, excuse me. Um, next up on the list is Dustin Keller. Now, unfortunately, Dustin Keller's career went downhill because of injuries, especially with the Dolphins. But to me, prior to getting guys like Tyler Conklin and Jeremy Ruckert, he was literally, in all honesty, the last good tight end we had. Like, he was an All-American tight end from the University of Purdue. He was known for his blocking, great route running, good hands, pretty solid athleticism. And he showed that in his rookie year. And believe it or not, I know a lot of people don't want to hear this, but that was a, he was, there was a good reason why he was Mark Sanchez's favorite target when Mark Sanchez was the quarterback. Because he was a good route runner, he had good hands, ran good routes, was very was an excellent, excellent blocker. Phenomenal blocker. He was a good tight end. I wouldn't put him in the same class. Obviously, he's not in the same class as Gonzalez and Gronkowski, but he was a very good tight end, nonetheless. He's a very solid tight end. Unfortunately, injuries derailed his career. I think he tore his ACL in a preseason game with the Dolphins. Which sucked because I really wanted him to do well, but hey, it is what it is. The next guy on the list is probably my second favorite New York Jets player of all time. My favorite Jets running back of all time, and that is Thomas Jones. Who's now an actor and goes by the name of Thomas Q. Jones. Now, some of you guys may argue that his best years were with the Bears, which may be true. But to sit there and look at his career with the Jets and say he sucked is completely bullshit and not true. Thomas Jones was, in my opinion, a lot of ways just as good with the Jets as he was with the Bears. I mean, he ran behind mostly a pretty good offensive line. He rushed for a thousand plus yards in his three in his three year tenure with the Jets. In each of his three years with the Jets, you could argue his best season was 2008, where he scored 15 rushing touchdowns, was an alternate to the Pro Bowl. Obviously, in 2009, when Rex Ryan became the head coach, he was a Thomas Jones was a part of a rushing attack that was number one in the NFL. He had a great career, Thomas Jones. I mean, he was phenomenal. He really was phenomenal. I mean, I know Giant fans at the time were bragging about how, you know, the speed of Lamar Bradshaw and the power of Brandon Jenkins, but the thing is, those guys fumble a lot. Thomas Jones rarely fumbled. He may not have the speed of the Montreal and the power of Brandon Jacobs. But he did what he had to do. He would average four yards a carry. He rarely fumbled. He was a decent receiver in the back, coming out of the backfield. He was a great blocker. And most importantly, he was a worker. He was a blue-collar type of guy. He said himself, my family worked in the coal mines. That inspired me to be a hard worker for the NFL. He was a leader. He didn't bullshit. He was a leader among men. He was just fun to watch, Thomas Jones. Personally, while I didn't hate the Ladanian Thomas signing in 2010, I would have preferred to kept Thomas Jones because Thomas Jones, in my opinion, I felt like he still had something left in the tank. I'm not saying that Danny Thomas didn't suck with us, but the thing is, he wasn't really a fraction of what he was in his prime. He was productive, but he really wasn't the same player that he was during the prime of his career with the Chargers. If we would have gotten a fraction of the player he once was with the Chargers, then I could understand. But 
you know, But yeah, Thomas Jones, I thought, was an excellent running back for a lot of years. You can argue he was a borderline Hall of Fame running back. The guy had a very good career in the National Football League, in my opinion. I thought he was very, very good. Now, before I get into my number one favorite New York Jets player of all time, I need to give you guys some honorable mentions. Uh, number one, uh, Eric Decker. I always liked Eric Decker. I thought he was a very good wide receiver. I will agree his best years were with Denver, but he had his first two years with the Jets. He was pretty damn good. You know, I'll never forget when the media was shitting on the Jets for signing. Like, why? He was a good receiver. And he proved it. I understand he was a number one receiver, but he's not a scrub. Next up is Chris Ivory. I love Chris Ivory. To me, in a lot of ways, he was a poor man's version of a Marshawn Lynch. He run, he ran hard and angry, but a lot of times he couldn't stay healthy. You know, that was his problem with the Saints. That was his problem with the Jets. But he was a very good running back, in my opinion. He was good catching the ball out of the backfield. He ran angry. I'll never forget his run against the Dolphins in 2015. That shit was sick. That was very Marshawn Lynch-esque, which I loved. And he was a good guy in the clubhouse. Next up is a guy who recently retired. Bilal Powell, he was a very good running back. He he could run inside, he could run outside, he could catch the ball out of the back when he was a very good football player, Bilal Powell. Fortunately, injuries derailed his career. But when he was healthy, he was a very good football player. I really liked him a lot. I really, really did. Next up is Brandon the Machine Marshall. Now, I know a lot of people didn't like Brandon Marshall because it was Weird obsession with Jay Cutler, but thankfully he got his head out of his ass in a minute that Jay Cutler was terrible. I know a lot of people don't like Brandon Marshall's personality, especially because of his bipolar disorder, but you can't deny this man's production. He was one of the best wide receivers of his era. He was tall. He had pretty good hands. He ran very good routes. He mostly dominated defensive backs. And there's one season within his first season with the Jets, he became the first and so far only Jets wide receiver to record 100 plus catches. Like, no, prior to Brandon Marshall, no Jets receiver recorded 100 plus catches in the season. Not even the great Al Toon. And he was great, Brandon Marshall. I think he had Hall of Fame talent. Could he get into the Hall of Fame eventually? Probably. But I think he's not going to get in the first of the year of eligibility because of his immaturity and off-the-field issues. Next up is Antonio Cromartie. Now, look, I did like Antonio Cromartie. I did feel he was a solid player. Did I think he was a great player? No. He was tremendously talented. He was a great athlete. But to me, he wasn't really a consistently... I mean, there were times where he just does some stuff. You're like, what the hell are you doing? But he was a solid player. He wasn't a bad player. He did, you know, in 2012 when Revis would have an ACL injury, Cromartie had stepped up and had a very good season. But other than that, you know, I didn't really look at Cromartie like a great player, but as a good player. And don't get me wrong, I liked him a lot. He was a very good player. He and Revis were definitely among the better cornerback duos the NFL has had in a while. But... You know, I think, you know, he could have played at a much higher level. Next up is Calvin Pace. Now, I know some of you guys may be surprised about this, but I've always liked Calvin Pace. Obviously, he had some good years with the Cardinals, but his best seasons were with the Jets. You know, one year he'll get seven sacks. Next year he'll got eight sacks. And 2013, believe it or not, was like the best season of his career. And it was the only time where Calvin Pace recorded 10 sacks, and he was phenomenal that year. He was a very good pass rusher. One say he was great, but he was a solid football player. He wasn't great. He wasn't amazing. He was a solid football player. Let's see. Who else before I give you guys my number one favorite Jet of all time? Um...
Leon Washington, almost forgot. Leon Washington. Leon Washington and Brad Smith. Now, these two guys... Now, Leon Washington's on the coaching staff of the Jets. And I like these two guys. These two guys were a solid football player. Leon Washington was a great return specialist. Obviously, 2009, he ended the season by tearing his ACL against the Raiders, which sucked. Then he would go to the Seahawks, return two kickoffs for touchdowns against the Chargers. But, you know, Brad Smith was pretty good, too. He wasn't a great player. He was more of a... He was more of a return specialist than a gadget guy, but he was a fan favorite. He was a good football player. I'll never forget when he returned a punt for a touchdown against the Bengals on Thanksgiving with one shoe off. And I'll never forget the Jets. He wanted to come back to the Jets, but of course the Jets did him dirty, and he winds up going to sign with Buffalo. Shaking my effing head. As for Leon Washington, he was a good running back. And he was a great return specialist. He was a good leader. He was a good guy in the clubhouse. Liked him a lot. Now for number one. And that is the guy who got into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in his first year of eligibility. And that is the man behind Revis Island, Darrell Revis. Now, Darrell Revis was part of a historic 2007 draft class. Uh, not just for the Jets, but for the NFL, speaking-wise. And when the Jets drafted Darrell Revis, people were like, who the fuck is this guy? Now, in his first two seasons, he proved himself to be a pretty good player. But he didn't really take the NFL by a storm until his third NFL season, where he established himself by many people as the best cornerback in the NFL. As a matter of fact, people regard 2009 Darrell Revis as the greatest cornerback season in NFL history, including one of Darrell Revis' best friends, Chad Johnson, or as some of the kids like to call him today, Chad Ochocinco. And when you look at the receivers he went against that year, first off, Darrell Revis finished the 2009 regular season with 31 passes to defense, six interceptions, one return for a touchdown. Look at the receivers he went up against. Andre Johnson, future Hall of Famer. Randy Moss, Hall of Famer. Held him in check twice. T.O., Hall of Famer, held him in check twice. Marcus Colston, very underrated, underappreciated wide receiver, held him in check. Roddy White, very good receiver, held him in check. Reggie Wayne, future Hall of Famer, held him in check. Uh, Chad Johnson, Chad Ochocinco, held him in check twice, once in the regular season finale and in the wild card game. Torrey Holt, Rams legend, played one year with the Jaguars, Held him in check. Steve Smith Sr. Held him in check. Um, who else am I missing here? Let's see. Andre Johnson. Randy Moss. T.O. Reggie Wayne. Marcus Colston. Roddy White. Steve Smith Sr. Torrey Holt. Sorry, let me count again. Andre Johnson, Randy Moss, T.O., Marcus Colston, Roddy White, Steve Smith Sr. Oh, God, I'm going to... So, in the regular season, <clears throat> he went up against nine of the NFL's premier receivers that year, and held him in check. Now, you can count 10 if you count Vincent. You can count 10 if you include Vincent Jackson in the divisional round in which Reeves held him in check there. But in the regular season, he went against Randy Moss twice, T.O. twice, Andre Johnson, Chad Johnson, Reggie Wayne, Steve Smith Sr., Marcus Colston, Roddy White, and Torrey Holt. Those guys were pretty damn good at what they were able to do throughout their NFL careers. <sighs> Those guys were very good wide receivers, very good to great wide receivers. As I said, if you, you can include 10 if you count Vincent Jackson in the matchup against the Chargers in the division round, which Revis held him in check. 
Um, Grievous was awesome to watch. Um, the Jets had no business trading him to the box in the 2013 season. Do I fault him for drawing New England? No, because the Jets were a clown show during the climax years of Rex Ryan. And, you know, he was on a, the Patriots, whether you love him or hate him. They're a well-run organization for the most part. Robert Kraft, in my opinion, is the best owner in the NFL. Um, he is the best owner in the NFL by far. And um, and he, you know, I was happy that he won a Super Bowl. Granted, it should have been with the Jets, but I blame the Jets for letting him go. Darrell Reeves said he never wanted to leave the Jets. He wanted to be a Jet his whole career, but the Jets did him dirty. I, I can't fault him for taking for what he did by joining the Patriots. He did have a very underrated season with the Bucks in 2013, but it is what it is. So yeah, that's my favorite. Some of those are my favorite Jets players of all time growing up. What are yours? Let me know in the comments down below. Peace out.